Kate Wardine. Um, here from Minneapolis, so I got in this morning, so apologies for my jet lag. Um, this is by far the coolest conference venue I've ever seen, so thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm here today to talk about developer-first leadership. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm here from Developer First, and also I work for Target Corporate. Um, so we're a large retailer in the United States. Um, we're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so it's already like, actually it's supposed to snow this Saturday, so it's coming up very quickly, our long winters. Um, yeah, but so in addition to being an engineering manager at Target Corporate, um, my passion for tech leadership also led me to founding Developer First this year. Uh, and so we provide new leaders with the resources, tools, and confidence to be great leaders in technology. And so I'll talk a lot more about that later in my presentation. Um, but I do like to warn you that these first couple of slides, I will ask some participation. Um, so it'll be a little bit interactive. So I do request that you help me and participate here. Okay, and so the first thing I, I like to do is to ask, why are you here? So we have a lot of awesome, awesome sessions right now at this very time. Um, what interested you about my topic? I want you to just to shout it out. Leadership. Leadership, yes. Is it raining or what is that? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's kind of cool. It's very relaxing. <laughs> Anyone else? Say that again. Format of one-on-ones. Format of one-on-ones, yes. I'll talk a lot about that. Thank you. Engage the Java chapter. Yes. I always get asked, I've done this talk at a couple of other developer conferences, and it's like, why are you here, you know, talking about leadership? So I hope that people have a, um, something they can take away even if you're not a formal manager. Okay, so I made you do it, so now I will. Um, I'm here for a couple reasons. I'll talk through three different reasons why I'm here. Uh, the first is my mom. Um, so this is her. Uh, I'm literally here. She gave birth to me here on Earth. Um, no, but when I became a boss for the first time a couple years back, I was talking with her about how she was really surprised that I had taken this career path. Um, she talked about some really horrible bosses that she had had, um, you know, when she first started her career. And I was thinking, you know, this is already a really hard time to be a woman in technology. She was talking about the, you know, the 1980s. She's the first one to graduate college. And I was like, man, your boss should really be the last one, you know, encouraging you from leaving the workforce. Um, and so I started thinking about, you know, the impact that bad bosses can have on a person, especially in technology, um, and thinking about whether I had made the right choice. Because as the saying goes, uh, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. Uh, my mom, I'm sure you're not, some people are nodding, you've had that experience. Um, it's true with my mom, with many others, I'm sure, in this room. Um, but I started to look into just how many. Um, and according to a 2017 Gallup engagement study, they said that 50% of respondents, so one in two um, people, are leaving their jobs because of managers at some point in their careers. Um, and this is actually a study of 27 million different employees across 2.5 million teams in almost 200 different countries. So it's a pretty global issue that we're talking about. Um, and the second reason is that engineers are picky when choosing where to work. So looking at our industry specifically, um, and these stats are actually for the United States, but I have to believe that these are relevant across different countries too with these proportions. Um, but so they estimate that people going into computer science and the like degrees, there'll be about 70,000 people graduating next year in 2020 in the United States. Um, but then according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Projections data, that's always a mouthful, um, there's going to be 700,000 different opens for software development positions. Um, so that's 10 times the amount of open positions per qualified candidates that are entering the market. Um, and so as organizations, we're really going to you know, have competition on really attracting those awesome software developers. Um, so we have to figure out how to stand out, and not only how to stand out, but how to retain people and keep them happy in our organizations, especially knowing our retention rates are at an all-time low. Um, according to another Gallup retention report, uh, one in four workers are going to quit their job this year for whatever reason, to go to the next job or whatever it is. And by 2020, this is actually one in three people. They say that software developers are staying at organizations shorter and shorter on teams, so about two to two and a half years is um, the average right now. Um, so retention is a really, really big issue for organizations. And really can't afford to ignore this. Um, $11 billion is lost annually due to employee turnover, and then 75% of these causes are actually preventable, they say. 
<clears throat> okay, so that's really that second reason why I'm here. Um, the third reason is that I myself um, have helped a lot of new managers, including myself actually, um, just struggle with that psychological shift um, and emotional shift from going from an individual contributor role to suddenly leading a group of people that I was you know, just sitting alongside on a Friday and then Monday I came back and I was their boss. Um, and I've talked to a lot of different people who have gone through a similar situation, um, and they didn't receive any tools or training. We just really had to get scrappy and figure out how to lead people. Um, and I found in researching that this is pretty common. Only 40% of people receive formal le um, leadership training when they become a boss for the first time. And that's pretty outrageous to me, considering all the training you get for all the other um, careers that you, that you go into and experiences in life. Um, like Lamaze class or accounting or, you know, you kind of get that training to like do what you'll need to do in your career, especially for something as important as leading humans. All right. So those are the three reasons why I'm here and why this topic is especially important to me. Um, you know, those reasons are 50% of people are leaving due to bad managers and engineers have many options on where to work. And then there's really that lack of training for new leaders. Okay, and so on agenda, we're going to be talking about why are we talking about this, which we've already done, um, what is developer-first leadership, and then what are some techniques that you can apply to your teams, whether you're in a formal leadership role, or a senior engineer, lead engineer, or even junior developer role. Okay, so throughout this talk, I'll be referencing some materials, and I have a special code on my website um, if you want to look at those now or if you want to look at those later. Um, I'll just reference when they are on the site, but feel free to take a look at those after, too. Um, so if you go to developer-first.com, and then under resources, there's workshop materials. Um, you'll click the JAX link, and then the password is JAX2019. All right, more participation, please. Um, I want to hear about the worst leader that you've ever had. Just throw out some adjectives. Bossy. Bossy. Untrustworthy. Untrustworthy. Bossy. Micromanager. Un jerk? Immature. Oh, immature. <laughs> I've had a jerk, so I can. <laughs> cool. Abusive. Abusive. Oh my gosh. Cool. <laughs> Dictator. Yeah, thank you. I think this kind of goes to show just how powerful this can be um, and how each of us, even if you didn't shout something out, have probably had a boss where you're like, man, I, it really sucks, you know, working for you or working with you. Um, so I like to think about, you know, why do bosses get a bad rap? So let's unpack this a little bit. I think a lot of things naturally stem from the media that we're exposed to. Um, so they're those degrading leaders, they're those task givers, they're the Bill Lumbergs of the world. Um, they're also just relentlessly cruel and cold. Um, and I think that, you know, if you don't have that formal training or those, the time to practice, you just kind of emulate what you see in the media. Um, and there's also those admirable tech companies taking strong stances by seeing what happens when they do completely flatten um, their organizations. And also, sometimes we're promoting our best engineers into boss roles when they really shouldn't be people leaders. Um, I think you can apply technical skills to a lot of different industries and jobs, but it's really hard to just directly apply those technical skills to leadership. And so we could just give up. Um, but a company that I admire most, um, they test these things out, and then they just report back to us so that we don't have to try out these things. Um, so Google wrote an awesome article about what they learned from flattening one of their organizations. Um, and to sum it up, they found that without managers, people were left searching for basic answers to questions and needs, as well as guidance in imp important areas such as career advice. And so it makes me think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you assume that things like psychological safety, food, shelter, that's already um, already set when people arrive to work. Um, our new foundation is that support, which is those things that Google describes. So just those answers to basic questions, being a sounding board, providing those resources for people to go on and do those amazing things like build awesome technology. And so without that solid foundation for them as leaders, we know that all of that awesome technology that we need people to build is not going to be possible. So that's great for myself and for others who have chosen this career path. Um, I think in most organizations, we're probably here to stay. Um, so I want to talk about the best leader you've had now. Have you had some really awesome leaders who you think back to um, in, a, in a positive light? And I want to hear some adjectives on this side as well. Say that again, I'm sorry. Good listener, yes, good listeners. Mutual respect. Mutual respect. Boundary? Empowering. Empowering, thank you. 
<laughs> Humble. Humble. I like that one. Transparent. Transparent. Yeah, honesty. That's big. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, so kind of hearing these responses and hearing how, how quickly people always respond to the bad leaders, um, I think we really do need to think differently about technical leadership um, so that we can solve these problems, so that we have um, zero people leaving due to bad managers. We're going to have to just develop awesome leaders. We're going to have to foster irresistible cultures so that people are wanting to come to our organizations. And then we're going to have to equip leaders with tools, actionable frameworks, and the confidence to be effective leaders for everybody. So I've started testing out some of these new ideas and tools that I'll share with you now. Um, and I've had some really great results compared to the U.S. national average for when I look at my team across the past couple years um, when it comes to engagement and then also retention. So this has just been kind of a fun way to say, okay, are these new things that I'm testing out working? Okay, so 40 slides ago, I promised that I would talk about developer-first leadership and what that means um, and how it can help us. And so it's actually really quite simple, and so I've tried to make it very simple, but it's a big mindset shift that I think um, will, will sound different to a lot of you and the leaders that you've worked for in the past. Um, and so how, how I like to think about it is that I work for my team and not the other way around. And that's where developer-first leadership comes in. So it's really like servant leadership, if you've, if you've heard of that, but really focused on the technical skills and the technical leadership that I need to do for my team. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, I'm going to go through seven different ways to practice developer-first leadership starting tomorrow. So hopefully some tactical ideas that you can bring back to your teams right away. Um, hopefully you're not returning to work tomorrow, maybe next week, because I know this conference goes a couple more days. All right, so number one is to remove blockers that prevent engineers from making progress towards professional and personal goals. And this does sound a little bit like that Scrum Master role, and so I find myself using a lot of those skill sets that a Scrum Master normally would to provide this um, resource for my team. And so tactically for me, this looks like um, in all of my one-on-ones, I'm collecting a, th a list of things that I can help my team members with and not the other way around. And so by the end of the day, I have this long list of things to go through for each person. Um, this could look like gathering information from other teams if they're working through a blocker or a dependency that maybe a back-end team needs to work if they need to unblock some work that my front-end developers are working through. Um, maybe they want to gain experience in a particular area, so I'm finding them resources for that. Um, or maybe just helping them navigate a hard conversation with another team or another teammate on our team. Honestly, this has been just as simple as changing the way that I phrase my questions. Um, so what can I help you with instead of do you have an update on this status update? Blockers can also disguise themselves as dynamics amongst the team um, through nonverbal communication. And so this is where I really think that, that those soft skills and that interpersonal intelligence is really, really important in being a people leader. Um, and these are skills that you need to really build confidence in and get practice in. Um, so if you sense that there are issues as the leader, you have to be the one to bring those up. Um, so as an example, um, a couple months back, I had a junior level developer who joined the team, um, and we were talking through a new requirement with our product owner, um, and he looks pretty confused um, just with all the business context we were talking through and the technical requirements and all that. Um, and so I pulled him aside after the meeting and said, hey, you know, does this all resonate with you? Can I help you get through any of these questions? Or you just looked a little confused. How can I help? Um, and so he was very confused. And so just getting through that blocker in disguise, I think, saved us a lot of time in the future just to say, hey, I noticed through your nonverbals that this wasn't quite resonating with you. How can I help you move forward? Another example, um, I had a lead engineer in one of my teams who just had a really negative attitude, um, and that was rubbing off on the rest of the team. A lot of these people who were you know, new to the career and really excited about the work we were doing, um, and so I had to pull them aside a couple of times and just say, this isn't acceptable. You, know, you, can, you can talk about these things you're upset about with me one-on-one, -on -one, um, but, but doing this in front of the team isn't appropriate, and it's bringing the rest of the team down, and so that's absolutely a blocker in disguise because it does impact the culture of the team. Blockers are also low performers. Um, make sure, if you're a people manager, that you're partnering, hopefully you have an HR organization at your work, um, that you can partner with to really do the due diligence to give that person um, the time and the action plan to improve. Um, and if not, not, make sure that you're finding them a way outside of your team or outside of your organization. Um, you're all high performers here. You're attending conferences. You know, you're trying to enhance your skill sets. And I'm sure you know how 
Um, how much it just sucks to have a low performer on the team who's, you know, just frankly just keeping their job when you're a high performer and you're working really hard. Um, so, you know, it's amazing what this can do to morale on both ways if you don't address it. Um, absolutely one of the worst parts of the job, though, by the way, is, is addressing these, these hard conversations. Um, but you really do gain a lot of respect as the leader to be the one to do that. Kind of on the flip side of this, um, this is an interesting conversation that I've had with other new leaders, is that you do have to let your superstars go. Um, one of the hardest things that I've also done is watching my A-plus team um, leave the team, knowing that I was actually the one to push them out. Um, I mentioned that the average time a person spends on a team is about two to two and a half years. Um, and I've really seen some leaders just hold, try to hold on and bribe you know, their best engineers to stay on their team, even if they're outgrowing their environment and not continuing to learn and not continue to be really engaged and excited on that team. Um, so tactically in my one-on-ones, I'm making sure that I'm asking questions like, you know, are you getting the experience that you wanted to when you joined this team still? Do you have all those um, opportunities to like maybe mentor someone or, or learn from someone more senior from you still on this team? Um, you know, is this business context still interesting to you? And if not, I'm helping them find a new opportunity, hopefully within our organization, um, or just maybe a new role on the team. All right, so number two is to empower your team. Um, at Target Corporate, we have a process called Best Team Survey, where we basically collect feedback upwards um, so that the engineers can share you know, how things are going anonymously. And so this is always one that, that pops um, as, a, as a, something that can be improved. Um, and that's to ensure that decisions are made at the level where the best information is available. Um, again, this year we heard this loud and clear. Um, some of the comments is, uh, that were written in is that it's disempowering to feel like something is being done to us instead of us in the driver's seat. Um, and I can absolutely relate. I'm sure you can too, regardless of what size organization you're in. Um, but sometimes it feels like the people you know, on the forefront working on the ground aren't really able to make those decisions when they do have the best information to make decisions. Um, I'm guilty of it myself uh, as a leader. So actually, I joined a new team in January this year. Um, so it's a supply chain technologies team. So we have all front-end applications. Um, and one thing I was tasked with is to make sure that you know, we have like 40 different applications that our various headquarters and then field supply chains like in warehouses have to use every day. Um, and so I was tasked with also, also making sure that it's a cohesive experience as they're navigating throughout their day. Um, and so I'm starting to have those conversations with our business partners um, and leaders on that side and getting really excited and like sharing back to my team like, hey, we're going to do this and this and this. Um, and people just weren't really excited. And I was like, oh, like what's going on? Like this is so cool. Look at this vision. Um, and I realized I wasn't bringing them along to those conversations, getting their buy-in, um, making sure that they're at that table talking about those technical um, implementations that we would have to do to realize this vision. And so I try to make sure that I'm really not committing to work without people moving forward. Um, and so a couple of things that have worked well for me are to, um, oops, that's not progressing. Oh, ah, oh no, close your eyes. <laughs> okay. Number one, sorry about that. Um, make sure that leaders and business partners are accessible to developers and vice versa. And this is especially important at a large organization like Target. Um, so we used to have a lot of meetings, I'm, I'm sure some of you can relate, where it's all like project managers or product owners or managers just attending and making decisions and then going back to the development teams and like, okay, here, go do this. Um, and I found that's really not empowering as a development team just to just be told what we're doing. Um, and so I try to reduce these and instead use tools like Slack or bring engineers into meetings um, some people hate meetings, but I find that some people actually do want to be involved in those early requirements gathering sessions so that they can understand what we're implementing. Um, I found that for especially complex issues, it's a lot faster to get us engineers in a room other than product owners talking through it. Um, it feels like a waste of time a lot of times when they just come back with a decision, we have to go back and forth via um, that middleman. Um, there's also, kind of tied to the theme of empowerment, there's an awesome story about how Steve Jobs would actually stop by people's desks the day after um, maybe a major incident had happened just to ask them what had happened and to get to the root of that um, of that cause. And I, I always think, like, man, that would be so intimidating. Um, but what, when asked about it, he actually said that he didn't want to play a game of telephone. He's like, I'm just going to go to the person, that engineer who worked on that product, who actually knows what's going on so I can get to the root of this issue. Um, and I think that's really, really empowering and an awesome sign of a great leader who just knows how to get to the bottom of an issue without playing a game of telephone. 
Um, another quote by Steve Jobs, um, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. Um, so I hire amazing engineers to think creatively and build new and innovative solutions. Um, if people are only listening to requirements and listening to orders, um, I, I cannot expect them to think creatively and truly own their work. Um, so I mentioned there's some resources online. Um, so one of them is just thinking about how to delegate. Um, again, this can be in whatever role you're in, if, even if you're not a manager. Try to think of other ways to give more junior level developers opportunities to grow. Um, so think about what types of decisions or tasks that you're doing right now that you could push to the team. Um, so what I usually like to do is like think about something I'm really struggling with and just try to get their advice. Um, also, there's a couple. We have a couple. Um, in my on my team a couple of different like release coordination meetings and I was like man I just really dread these is anyone really in the release coordination like maybe they could go and represent the team and just also get those leadership skills and soft skills to talk about and represent our team and I actually found a couple of people who wanted to so I was like this is great and I don't have to go and now you can go um, so think about things like that that you could do that you could delegate to your team members Another thing, and this is absolutely um, relative to those lead, um, more, more seasoned engineers, is to wait for conversations to play out. Um, don't always be the one offering up your opinion first. Um, if people are frequently looking to you, try to just be quiet and see what other people will come up with as, as a leader of that team. Um, and especially for people who have recently gone into management who were previously engineers, this is really, really challenging. Um, but it's even that much more important um, because you do want to make sure you're empowering the team to make those decisions. Has anyone read the book uh, Multipliers by chance? Okay. It's a, it's a really awesome book um, about, about leadership and the difference between, she calls it, multipliers um, and diminishers and how multipliers um, are very empowering and just make sure that they're not always the one offering up answers because then that just diminishes um, the brilliance of the people around them. Um, so for those who have been in engineering for a while, make sure that you're not being a genius and always the one answering the questions, but be a genius maker. Um, so multipliers get more from the people because they are leaders who look beyond their own genius and focus their energy on extracting and extending the genius of others. So sometimes it's impossible to um, push things to the team or to delegate everything. Um, and then I find it just really just important to provide context. Um, so whether, you know, to the team it's financial, like, hey, we just really have to work on this feature because it's going to save this amount of dollars and blah, blah, blah. Um, or if we're backing into a um, advertising or marketing campaign in stores and we just have to meet these timelines and reprioritize the tech, this tech debt to do later. Um, providing that context and how our work ties into the bigger picture of the organization organization is really vital in just making sure people are brought along into the vision. Um, and kind of on the flip side, if, if we are prioritizing tech debt that we as an engineering team want to do, um, it's also providing that context as the leader to the business partners and making sure that you're providing that context really well as the leader of that engineering team. So kind of wrap up um, this, this theme, I found that context is really huge. And so providing, honestly, even more context than I think is necessary has been really, I think, impactful and helpful to my team to understand what we're, what we're doing here. OK, so number three is to share credit, take blame. Um, at large companies, um, frequently developers can get lost um, in recognition. And so what I try to do is associate names with accomplishments. So this person worked on this, which enabled this big enterprise initiative. Um, and what I've also um, learned is that not all recognition looks the same. Uh, so when someone joins my team, I like to ask them, you know, how do you like to be recognized? And so also for you more junior or more senior level developers, ask the junior level developers, how do they like to be recognized? So that you're not recognize them in front of a group of 100 people if they don't like that, if they just want a direct message. Make sure you're understanding that before you recognize people. Um, the take blame piece as a leader, um, we have to make sure that we're loyal when recovering from an ugly failure. Um, so at Target, we have a process from uh, a process for recovering and learning from production issues that impacted our guests the previous day. Uh, so every morning at 7.30 in the morning, we have a call, and those who are working on teams um, that had an impacted application, they were joined and kind of talk about what happened, what they did to fix it. And it's really just an um, empowering culture. It's not a blameful culture. People just talk about what they did to fix it, what controls or measurement they set up so that it wouldn't happen in the future, so that other application teams can then do the same thing. Um, 
And so, like I said, the culture is, is really great. And so here, leaders go and represent their teams. And so unlike my, my previous advice to bring developers in and encourage people to go, um, I'm always the one to go and represent the team and make sure that people aren't feeling like I'm not on their side. Um, and I'm actually representing them as a team, unless they really, really want to go represent um, after an incident. I've never had anyone volunteer to do that. Um, yeah, so here, you know, I'm never bringing up names. It's my team. I'm accountable as the leader. And so also during, like, production issues or troubleshooting, um, I like to find myself um, in a particular role, so mostly empowering. Um, so I'm shielding the team as they're troubleshooting so people aren't slamming them with questions on Slack. Just make sure that they have the time and the focus to get through and fix the problem. Um, I'm asking, you know, how can I help? What do you need from me? Um, honestly, usually just getting out of the way. Um, leading the team through the root cause analysis so that they can learn from and, and set up controls for the future. Um, and then, like I said, also speaking on behalf of the team after major incidents. Okay, so number four is to never devalue people in the process of delivering a solution. Um, I've always said that my focus is about the individuals on my team and their happiness. I care about and I'm responsible for the results that we're delivering as an engineering team. Um, but it's my job to care about and enable them as people first. I've learned that when it comes to humans, abstraction is bad. Um, we're not in assembly lines anymore, so what someone can produce and what someone is worth is a lot more complex than we can put numbers around. So for performance reviews, I really discourage people from using um, the number of lines of code that they delivered or even the number of Jira story they closed. Um, I really like to talk about value in a lot of different other ways, um, <clears throat> like their value to the team, um, the organization, that they're getting joy out of their work, that they're enhancing their skills, their soft skills, all of that. Um, so we need to stop calling people resources. I think this is a very outdated even thing to say now, which is great, but we do have to stop calling people resources and stop moving them around like they are. We know that they're going to leave. Um, they can go anywhere. Now, hopefully this one is ingrained into the minds of the people who have worked for me in the past, um, but there is no argument that makes this formula incorrect. Um, I've worked with people who have just sacrificed everything, their sleep, their families, their personal lives, um, and the leaders just let it happen. Um, and so a great way to use your authority as a senior engineer, as an um, engineering manager, is to not incentivize or award these scary situations. Um, so, for example, at, you know, at Target, we have, you know, it's retail peak season, so Thanksgiving, Black Friday, those are really vital times for us. And so sometimes people do have to be on site and away from their families. And so the past couple of years, I've really pushed to make sure we can just cover remotely so that you can have short shifts, you're at home. Um, we have all the technology to do that now. Um, so that was a really, really great way to, for me to use my authority to fight for my team um, and also then provide them comp days when they are working on holidays or working on weekends. Um, there are some companies that are literally saving lives, um, but I'm fortunate to work for one who isn't. Um, so no one's going to die because of the work that we do or don't do. Um, and so, you know, sacrificing your personal or your family life isn't an option to me as your leader. Um, one of the pet peeves about our culture, and I'm definitely guilty of it myself, is that the first question we ask is, you know, what do you do? Um, and I think a better question, especially as someone's leader, is, you know, who are you? But that's a really awkward question to ask, so I think, you know, there's a lot of other ways to get at that question. Um, and some things that I do, honestly, is in my one-on-ones, just make sure that I'm asking questions about, you know, how's your family? What did you do this weekend? How was your vacation? Make sure we get to that personal stuff before we get into what they're working on. Um, other ways that are do team building activities outside of work if it's feasible. If you have remote teams, um, make sure you're finding fun ways to integrate and, and collaborate online um, via all the awesome tools that we have now at our fingertips. Um, Radical Candor is one of my other favorite books by Kim Scott. Um, so she says, your job as a leader is to not to provide purpose, but instead get to know your direct reports well enough to understand how each one derives meaning from their work. Um, I found that most people, all people, are just really trying to balance their lives, um, and they're going to feel a lot more connected to the team and to their work um, if you can bring your personal stories in. Um, another, I mentioned some resources online, so I have a couple different ways to get at those um, career conversations um, while bringing their goals in. I found that it's not always the easiest thing to talk about career goals and technology because they're changing so fast. Um, but here's just a kind of a way to get at, you know, what do people want to do with their lives? What do they want to do with their careers? Um, so feel free to check these out at my website as well. 
Um, so now about diversity and inclusion. Um, there's so many different studies I could talk for hours about how important diversity and inclusion is on a team um, because there's so many different unique ways that employees think and learn and relate to others, approach the world, um, and, and see their work. Um, we can talk, you know, like I said, for hours about the benefits. There's financial benefits. There's organizational benefits. There's just so many different benefits. Um, you can't argue that diversity isn't an amazing and a very important thing in our organizations, especially in technology. Um, and so as leaders, we do have to make sure that we are the ones to be our authentic selves every day at work without question so that our team members can also do the same. Um, I found that people are going to bring their whole human self to work every day without question, um, even if we ask them not to. Um, and if they try not to, they're going to be spending their energy on that instead of building awesome technology. Um, so instead of finding ways to fit in, I try to really find ways to reap the benefits of their diverse characteristics. Um, and this is honestly really where inclusion comes in and really promoting inclusive environment as a leader. Um, I've had people come to me with situations that don't align with this on my teams, even if I wasn't physically present during the incident. Um, and so I took accountability. I made sure I said, I'm responsible for this. You know, this is a team that I'm leading and I would do everything in my power to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, and so as a leader, you do have to foster inclusive cultures and make sure that people feel comfortable to bring those to you um, when they aren't aligning with that. Now, I do think there are a couple attributes where diversity doesn't make sense. And when I'm hiring for, when I'm interviewing people, I actually look um, for the opposite. So I look for people who actually look the same in these attributes. Um, the number one is values. Um, I find that if your values don't align to the organization that you're working for, you're going to spend all your energy trying to fight it and figure out why you're at this organization. Um, number two is work ethic. So I only hire really motivated, curious, um, driven people. Um, obviously, people have their off days, but this has to be your on day. Attitude, um, so I don't hire people with bad attitudes that are going to bring the team down. And then past failures, you have to be willing to talk about how you failed in the past. That's always an interview question of mine, you know, tell me about a failure and what you learned from it. If you say nothing, I'm going to know you're lying or if you can't think of that. Um, I want to make sure that you're able to share those past failures with other people on the team so that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. Number five is to be vulnerable and authentic as a leader. Um, again, this is the time where we do have to use our authority to lead and to influence. Um, I've had to share some, you know, hard messages. I'm at a really big, uh, a really big organization. Share some hard messages that come down from upper level leadership that we don't really have, you know, a say in what's happening. Um, and so I've learned that it's okay to, you know, kind of share my, you know, filtered opinion on what's happening and promise to get more context to follow up later with as much information as I can. And so I do try to bring my tone and my opinions into it as their leader, um, just to make sure that they know that I have their backs. Um, similar to how I expect team members to talk about their failures, I also make sure that I want to talk about my own. Um, so we've started, we have a weekly team huddle with everyone on my teams, um, and we start with TIL. So this week I learned, um, and I want people to bring up, like, oops, I, I did this huge mistake, like this, I feel like an idiot, and I want you guys to all learn from this. Um, or, hey, I learned about this really cool new tool that I, I want to share with you. Um, so we always start our all team huddles with our stories of struggle from that week. Um, and I've, I've never found that people don't bring that up now. It's a really, really comfortable and welcoming environment. Um, so that's a fun thing to introduce if you don't already do something similar in your team meetings. So along the lines of being authentic, um, I was shocked to learn that this is my dad's LinkedIn profile picture. Um, so I was, especially because he's in consulting, so you know he's getting a new gig every six months or so. Um, and I was talking to him, I was like, oh my gosh, I, how do people take you seriously like when you're interviewing? Um, and he's like, you know, I don't want to work for a company that, that can't understand and, and um, my sense of humor. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's actually a really good lesson that I'm going to take um, when I'm hiring people and when I'm you know, promoting my, my own personal brand, um, when I'm looking for new roles and stuff. Um, because he is one of these retention stats that I care about and that I'm concerned about. So I want to make sure that people with, you know, his multiple, multiple years of experience are, you know, wanting to come to my organization and, and work on my teams and feel that they can be their unique selves. Um, especially knowing that they can go anywhere. All right, so number six out of seven, uh, prioritize and focus. I actually did this little segment of this talk for a group of high schoolers a couple weeks back. Um, so I don't mean to offend anyone, but I do think that these are skills that a lot of people lack. Um, I actually find that I still lack these skills, um, but you know we're really busy people, um, and I found that my career really didn't start accelerating until I found out you know how to focus on the things that actually matter. 
Um, because, you know, I don't have a maker schedule anymore. I have a manager schedule and my day is usually four overlapping meetings at a time. Um, I'm trying to be in multiple places at once. Um, definitely no time to react to fires or changes. Um, so for those of you who are also managers or project managers, I'm sure you can relate, um, to this type of schedule. Um, and so a couple of tips of advice, um, don't multitask on the important things. Um, multitasking actually causes a 10% drop in productivity, or I'm sorry, in IQ. Um, and then it leads to as much of a 40% drop in productivity. So you show that a human brain actually can't focus on more than one task at a time. Um, so we're actually really single threaded. Um, even though we think we're multitasking, your brain is actually just really quickly, rapidly switching between those tasks. Um, so what I try to do is, you know, don't have that important one-on-one -on -one conversation on the phone when we, while I'm reading emails or don't write all my performance reviews while I'm watching the office. Um, I just try to make sure that I'm not multitasking on those important things. Another useful tool, um, if you do have a pile of to-do lists, is to use this Eisenhower matrix. Um, so it kind of organizes based on important versus not important and then urgent versus not urgent. Um, so it's a nice way, maybe at the start of your day, at the start of your month or year, just kind of write down all the things that you want to accomplish and how, how you could segment these, these different tasks. All right. Um, I'm a strong believer that your morning set the tone for the rest of your day. I've been doing a lot of research on time management um, and really prioritizing your work and, and um, being really productive. And I've always found that people always talk about the mornings. Like all the ex experts always start with, okay, what do you do in the morning? Um, I've found that actually did a little study. So for three months, I filled out this um, little pedometer and said, I said, how do I feel um, based on how yesterday went? Um, and I always found that these were the things in common that I did every day that made me feel like the good or the energized. Okay, so number one is gratitude. Make sure you think about what you're thankful that day. Maybe it's your bed or your dog or your partner or vacation coming up, whatever it is. It's really hard to have a bad day if you think about something that's going well in your life um, right away. Number two, and I hate this one, but exercise in the morning. I found that I felt way better if I exercise in the morning. Um, commit to a focus. Um, so as I said, there's so much coming at you as a manager every day. Um, I like to try to have my one focus of that one thing I want to do that day, and I can look back and say, okay, did I actually do that? And if not, maybe grab some time later in the day to, to make sure I'm finishing that so I can feel like I've accomplished something. And then hour by hour, I actually just literally write out every single hour what I'll be doing. It feels a lot less intimidating to be like, okay, I can get through this. Um, another thing that was hard for me is to make sure that I'm stop, I'm not signing up for a lot of things um, that really don't tie back to that focus and what's important. Um, I've learned that when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. We only have a certain amount of hours each day. Um, there's a really powerful activity, um, again, on the website, um, inspired by uh, Warren Buffett. Um, so he, it forces you to think about 25 different things you want to accomplish maybe that week or in life. Um, and then narrow them down to the top five and really think through some powerful question about why you want to do those five and then actually completely just ignoring those other 20. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing if you want to check that out. Um, also, it's, it could be really powerful to audit yourself. Um, so sometimes it you know, becomes a little um, bit mysterious to be like, what am I even spending my time on? Um, and so I like to look back maybe at the last week and say, okay, I'm going to group into these buckets. And then am I proud of that? Like, am I proud of what I'm, how I'm spending my time and the proportions of things that I'm spending my time on? Would I be proud to show my team? Would I be proud to show my family, etc.? cetera? Um, and if not, adjust. Um, so you can say, here's what I'm doing now. And imagine you have 10 hours next week. How do you want to be spending your time and what proportions of your time do you want to be spending your time on? So whether it's, you know, 50% of coding, you know, 30% reviewing other pull requests, et cetera. How do you want to be breaking out your time so that you can tell your leader, you know, here's how I spend my time. Um, here's how I want to be spending my time. Okay, and so the last one is to invest in your communication skills. Um, and here's where we'll talk a little bit about one-on-ones. Um, in my longer sessions, I spend a lot more time on one-on-ones. I know that's a, a very big question for especially new leaders. Um, but a couple, a couple tips here um, is to, number one, just stop talking. Um, in my, when I first became a leader, this was really a struggle for me. Um, so I would spend a lot of time preparing for my one-on-ones, making sure we had an agenda for each person. Um, and what I realized was that it wasn't up to me to do all the talking. It's about the team member. It seems very obvious now. Um, but these, these meetings are really for the individual, the engineer, to talk about what's on their mind um, and what they need help with and not what I need. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I actually used to dread them because I'd be so drained preparing for them. And I wanted, would want them to go well, would want to make sure that I'm getting them everything they need. Um, but what I, what I realized is I just need to stop talking and, and listen to what, what they need. Um, and so four one-on-ones, um, just a couple, a couple check boxes here is to make sure that they're regularly scheduled. Um, so I advise at least every other week for 30 minutes. Um, I make sure that they're rarely missed. Um, so I, I block them on my calendar as, you know, these aren't negotiable. If we need to move them, let's make sure we get them this week. If you, if you have something to talk about, um, and like I said, make sure they're focused on the team member and not about what you need as the leader. It's focused on the team member and what they need. So some questions that'll get the conversation going immediately. Um, I hate awkward silence. Um, and so I think that's another reason why I would just try to prepare and make sure we had stuff to talk about. Um, is I would just say, you know, what is on your mind? Um, this is a question that I like because it says, let's talk about what matters most to you at this moment right now. Um, I've never had anyone say nothing, um, which I was actually really surprised about when I first started asking this question. Um, my husband says this sometimes, but no, no team member says nothing is on their mind. Um, say more. So if I'm not fully understanding what they're trying to articulate, um, I'm, like I said, context is huge. So I just want to really understand what people are saying. So saying say more, um, lets them elaborate on the details and what they're trying to get across. And then I always end with, you know, how can I help? Um, I love this one because it's forcing them to make a direct and open request. And I'm, I'm proving that I, I don't think I know what's best. I don't think I know what they need. Um, I want to make sure that I'm staying curious and not assuming what people need. I think a lot of our, our time as humans is just spent on doing things that we think people need. Um, and so I find that I like to just directly ask what they need that week from me. Um, so leaders don't provide the answers. They ask great questions. Um, kind of on the site, there's some, I have a list of questions. Um, there's a handout you can print out and bring to your one-on-ones if, if you want some to refer to. Um, so these are just some to kind of get the conversation going or just to continue using throughout your, your one-on-ones. All right, now I always like to end with talking about social styles because um, I think this is something that goes overlooked a lot, especially in technology organizations. Um, I've come to realize that it's really important as a leader to understand different social styles and how people naturally and instinctively communicate with each other. Um, and so this is one of my favorite. There's a ton of different studies you can do um, online, um, but I like this one. So it's analytical, driver, amiable, and expressive. And it basically focuses on how, if people are better at facts and data, um, and then if they're um, introverted or extroverted. Um, and so... What I like to do is actually, if, if people are willing, they can do, everyone on the team can do it and say, hey, here's my social style, here's how I prefer to be communicated with, et cetera. Um, but what I have found, um, and I, I guess I'll have you guess, um, which one do you think most um, engineers are in software development? Analytical, yeah. Yep, so fact-based introvert. Um, yeah, a lot of engineers are analytical, and that's why they're in this industry. Um, and so we're mostly, you know, dealing with analytical personality and communication styles um, until you move up into leadership and other business areas. Um, and so I like to do a lot of research on how do I best communicate with people. Um, so analyticals are, you know, constantly assessing, determining pros and cons, making lists of things to do. They value accuracy and details. Um, quick to think and slow to speak. They like to plan thoroughly before deciding to act. Um, prefer to work alone and has a tendency to work on processes, tasks, and doing things the right way. Um, so, you know, as someone interfacing with an analytical, it's important to be precise, specific, thorough, prepared, accurate, rational, and orderly when communicating with them. Um, and then I like to think about, you know, my business partners and, and when I'm switching and I'm going into meetings with my engineers and then business partners, how do I change my communication style? Um, because most of my business partners are expressive. Um, and I find that I get really, really annoyed when I'm like, oh my gosh, just stop talking about your vision and what you're excited about. Like, I just want to make this a little more, more transaction. Like, what do you need from me? What, what do you need? You know, what do I need from you? Um, and so I found that I do have to make sure that I'm focusing on the big picture and changing the way that I communicate um, when I'm meeting with different people. Um, so you have to be a little bit more enthusiastic. You have to be a little bit more expressive, friendly, et cetera. Um, and so that was just a really big takeaway that I'm, I'm still working on is to make sure that I'm trying to understand different people's communication styles and how to best communicate with them. 
all right, last one is to listen. Um, again, I said, you know, it was a, a big aha moment when I was like, man, I just need to, to shut up and listen to people. Um, and that also means listening without distractions. So no cell phones in my one-on-ones. You know, I'm not reading email. I'm not multitasking. I'm giving my full focus to you. Um, and especially in meetings, um, I've had some examples where I'm like, hey, I'm really distracted mentally by, you know, this situation. So I really apologize. I'm trying to be as present as possible. But I like to make that just like clear and upfront with people so that they don't misinterpret um, maybe my distraction as like, I don't care about or I'm not listening to you. Um, I'm sure you've all had those meetings where people just don't seem mentally present. Um, and so I actually like to call people out to like, hey, would there be a better time to have this conversation? You don't, you don't seem to be fully present here. Um, so as leaders, we do have to make sure that we're attentive and thoughtful about those types of conversations. Um, and so again, in my longer workshops, we do spend a lot more time on this and your purpose and making sure that you do understand your purpose um, as a leader before you help others determine their purpose and their careers and their lives. Um, so based on a lot of research I've, I've um, I've read through by Corn Ferry. Um, there's a huge correlation between leader self-awareness and actually organizational financials. Um, so it's really interesting to talk about um, your purpose. And you know, I, I know that's not a conversation a lot of people have at work, um, but I think it's a really compelling story just to say like this is these are important conversations if we want our businesses to be successful. Um, so yeah, take a look into, into some of that research too if that's an interesting topic to you. But just to kind of wrap this up here, um, people are our most important assets at organizations. I don't care which type you're at. Um, and when we put it that way, our jobs as leaders are really, really vital. Um, so we do have to be tenaciously committed to the growth of each individual. Um, so I want to do everything, and I want to keep helping other people do everything, everything that they can to be the best leaders they can so that we have, like I said, zero people leaving due to bad managers. We are, um, can stand out as preferred workplaces to grow talent and to retain talent, and then we can make sure that training is required for people entering leadership roles. Um, so for those in leadership roles, I like to you know, ask you, how do you want your team to describe you as a leader? Um, take that as your takeaway, even if you're not in a, in a formal leadership role. You know, how do you want your team to describe you as a mentor or whatever type of role you play? All right. Thank you so much, everybody. This is where you can find me. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, you can follow the website there, as I mentioned, for a bunch of different resources. Um, but I really appreciate your time today and for coming to my topic. Thank you. Thank you.